Lord Sumption will explain the judgment of the court. Uh, this appeal arises out of the Home Secretary's decision to exclude Mrs. Miriam Rajavi from the United Kingdom. Uh, Mrs. Rajavi is a dissident Iranian politician currently resident in Paris. Uh, she is, for practical purposes, the leader of an organization called Mujahideen al khalq or MEC, which is opposed to the regime which has governed Iran since the deposition of the Shah in 1979. Until 2001, MEC sponsored terrorism targeted against the Iranian government, and for a number of years in the 1980s, its armed wing fought alongside the Iraqi army in the Iran-Iraq war. It was at one stage a prescribed organization under the Terrorism Act 2000. However, after it renounced terrorism in 2001, its prescription as a terrorist organization was revoked in 2008, by the tribunal charged with hearing appeals on behalf of prescribed organizations. It is common ground that it is now committed to pursuing its objects by peaceful means. And because Mrs. Rajavi is not a European Union citizen, she is not entitled as of right to enter the United Kingdom. She requires leave to enter. Under the immigration rules, the Home Secretary may personally direct that somebody in that position may be, shall be excluded from the United Kingdom if she considers that that person's presence here would not be conducive to the public good. In 1997, the then Home Secretary exercised this power by directing that Mrs. Rajavi should be excluded. He gave two reasons. One was that her presence here was undesirable for, <coughs> for reasons of foreign policy. The other was that it was necessary to take a firm stand against terrorism. She remains excluded to this day. In December 2010, uh, Lord Carlisle asked the Home Secretary on behalf of a group of parliamentarians to revoke her predecessor's direction so as to enable Mrs. Rajavi to enter the United Kingdom in order to address parliamentarians in the Palace of Westminster about the situation in Iran and the rest of the Middle East. The Home Secretary recognizes that MEC is now a peaceful political movement but on Foreign Office advice, she declined to allow Mrs. Rajavi to revoke the decision. Uh, she declined to revoke the decision in Mrs. Rajavi's case for reasons of foreign policy. Those reasons were, in summary, that Mrs. Rajavi and MEC remained highly controversial in Iran in spite of their conversion to peaceful methods. There is, in the opinion of the Home Secretary and the Foreign Office, a significant risk that her admission to the United Kingdom would cause a deterioration in our relations with Iran. Uh, given the volatile internal situation in Iran, that would be liable to lead to violence against British people and British interests and embassy and consular employees in Iran. It would also be liable to hinder attempts by the United Kingdom to engage with Iran on significant current issues, including nuclear proliferation, international terrorism, and specific consular issues affecting British subjects and British protected persons. This appeal arises out of an application for judicial review of that decision by Lord Carlisle, a number of his fellow parliamentarians, and Mrs. Rajavi herself. They contend that the decision is an unlawful and disproportionate interference with their rights under Article 10 of the Human Rights Convention, which protects freedom of speech. This contention was rejected by the judge and then by the Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court, by a majority, Lord Kerr dissenting, dismisses the appeal and affirms the decision of the courts below. All four of the majority have written judgments. There are differences of emphasis between them, in what follows, I shall summarize the essential reasons which are common to all four. Foreign policy is an area in which the courts have traditionally been reluctant to disturb the decisions of ministers. There are two main reasons. One is the constitutional separation of powers under which government decisions in the conduct of UK foreign policy are regarded as peculiarly the province of ministers. The other is that such decisions commonly raise difficult questions of judgment on which the government, because of its experience and access to a wide range of specialized information and advice, is likely to be more competent to form a view than the courts. Since the Human Rights Act incorporated the convention into English law, it has been clear that when a convention right is invoked, it is ultimately for the court to decide whether it has been unjustifiably infringed. However, the two factors which I have mentioned remain powerful elements in the court's decision, 
and particularly in its assessment of the evidence relied upon by the government to justify their decision on foreign policy grounds. In the present case, it is common ground that the applicant's Article 10 rights uh, were engaged by the Home Secretary's decision. Article 10 is, however, a qualified right. It is open to the state to curtail freedom of speech on grounds which are provided for by law and are necessary in the interests of, among other things, national security, public safety, and the protection of the rights of others, provided that the measures which it takes to protect these interests are not disproportionate to the underlying problem. The first argument advanced on behalf of the applicants is that the Home Secretary is not entitled to take account of a threat to the United Kingdom's interests and policies, which arises uh, from uh, threats emanating from people who do not share the United Kingdom's democratic values. The Supreme Court rejects that submission. The Home Secretary is not concerned with the democratic credentials of those who threaten the national security of the United Kingdom or the safety and rights of others. She is only concerned with the gravity of the threat and the consequences if it were to materialize when measured against the interference with the human rights involved. The second argument advanced on behalf of the appellants in effect invites us to say that the Home Secretary's judgment on these matters was mistaken. The Supreme Court declines to do so. A predictive judgment by, a foreign, by the Foreign Office of the likely reaction of a foreign country to a UK government decision is not easy to test empirically. It is a question of informed and experienced judgment by those with direct experience of dealing with these matters, experience which the courts can rarely match. The evidence of the Foreign Office on which the Home Secretary relies, which reflects the advice given to her at the time, amply justifies her decision if it is taken at face value. There is no reason not to take it at face value. No application was made to cross-examine the Foreign Office witness, and the case was advanced on the basis that the primary facts were not disputed. The Home Secretary's judgment about the significance of those facts was well within the latitude which the law allows to ministers making a judgment in such a specialised and sensitive area. This court cannot quash her decision without a proper evidential basis on which to do so, and in this case there is none.